Well, we can speak now to the former Chancellor, Ken Clark, who is now in the House of Lords. Thank you very much for being uh, with us uh, this evening, Mr Clark. What was your reaction to what the Chancellor announced today? I thought it was OK. Uh, I was worried that he might get carried away because the economy is in a very uh, worrying state. Uh, and uh, the main job he has to achieve over the next couple of years is to save us from going into a recession or to back to stagflation, try to get us back to healthy growth as soon as he can in this uncertain world. So he remained reasonably responsible. He's, he, he did have a bit to play with because inflation actually has been increasing his tax revenues. Uh, uh, certainly, you know, in, in numerical terms, uh, and therefore he had a bit to play with, a bit he could do to help. And he, uh, I, you know, we can all argue about the actual mix. He did some things I like better than others, but it was okay. And he keeps on. He's a responsible, sensible man. And he does have a sense of the national interest and you know where we are in a couple of years' time, as well as where we might be tomorrow. You talk there about the, you know, the need for caution, effectively. But as you say, there was this effective windfall of around £20 billion because of increased tax revenues. Would you have liked to see more help for the very poorest, the people who are on the breadline, who are really going to be hit in the form of rising I energy bills? And I personally would. Uh, I, the, you know, left my, if I, I'd been doing it, I think I would have tried to resist the five pence off fuel tax, which is rather symbolic and was a result of pressure all, 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 all the time, uh, because... It, because uh, it's gone up by more than 5p a day, or we'll be lost in the mix. People will forget it in a day or two that he's reduced the fuel tax at all, and there'll be another row in 12 months' time when he tries to uh, reinstate it. Uh, the one thing he didn't do that I think I would have done is do something for people on universal credit. Uh, th there's very little in this for people who've lost their job, haven't got a job, uh, the very poorest. And what we don't want as living standards are about to drop in this acute crisis, uh, we don't want to see more people going into abject poverty. So that's the one thing I would have done, and I probably wouldn't have done the fuel tax. You talk there about people going into real poverty. I'm sure you won't mind me saying, describing you as someone who's, you know, been a keen observer of politics for some decades now. We're talking, <laughs> we're talking about, you know, a, a drastic fall in living standards that they're most on record. Have you ever really seen anything like this? No, Rishi's unlucky. This is a completely unprecedented in my lifetime, certainly in my political time. Uh, I mean, the, the economy just keeps ha ha hit, being hit by severe blows. Uh, a hard Brexit, COVID, now Russian sanctions because of the Ukraine war. Uh, th th these are dreadful blows, and we're, we're about to see uh, huge surges in inflation. Uh, certainly the last two aren't the government's fault but you have to steer the economy through them and make sure it comes out in a healthier state as soon as you possibly can. Uh, the, the, uh, th that's why he hasn't blown all this uh, extra revenue described as a, a, a windfall. Uh, he has continued to try to get debt back to an acceptable, affordable level because as interest rates go up, debt's going to get more expensive. And he's, he's you know, tried to get the total level of debt to continue falling compared with our GDP. Uh, what we need to do, of course, is get back to healthy growth with low inflation as soon as possible. But over the next uncertain 12 months, uh, we've no idea quite what to expect uh, because the Ukrainian war is still going on. And there's worldwide disruption to supply lines and worldwide inflation in energy uh, costs. So all that's still to be coped with. He was right not to just blow the lot. I'm interested to get your view on what's going on with taxes. Rishi Sunak says this is the biggest net cut to personal taxes in over a quarter of a century. But the OBR say that actually the net tax cuts announced today only offset a sixth of the tax rises announced by this chancellor. Can Rishi Sunak really describe himself as a tax-cutting chancellor yet? Well, that was a hard sell. Uh, I, I mean, he, 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 he was, it was quite impressive the way he tried uh, to get it across. That was presentational. The, the OBR are correct. Um, Rishi had to spend enormous sums of money on the furlough scheme, which was a 
huge success. The economy could have collapsed when we hit the brick wall of lockdown uh, almost two years ago. Then he had to spend more enormous sums of money uh, on the health service as a deal with the health consequences of the COVID outbreak. Our debt has soared to an extraordinary level, and he has had to be a tax-raising chancellor. This only slightly offsets that. The other thing I think he was uh, unwise to do, reckless to do, was to keep sticking to this cut in income tax in two years' time. He, he seems determined to cut income tax before the next election. Uh, if he, he, now he's announced it, he's going to have to stick to it. Uh, and that may involve doing all kinds of things and or not being able to do things that he might want to do over the next two years. And nothing wrong with a 20 pence uh, standard rate of income tax, in my view, probably because that's the target I set for it as I moved income tax down towards it uh, when I was Chancellor. But I put up other taxes, but I didn't have to put up taxes to the, the extent that Rishi has been forced to do. Presenting it as a, a great tax-cutting bonanza is, um, you know, all part of salesmanship, really, but it's not a frightfully accurate description of the package. Is it political, you think, this, uh, or a coincidence that the income tax cut comes in the same year as the election? Well, he keeps stressing that he wants to reduce income tax before the election, as though an income tax cut on his own sort of buys an election result. Uh, he, he seems, uh, I mean, whether the Prime Minister is pressing him for a popular income tax cut on the eve of the election, I don't know. Um, but it's, 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 it is entirely political uh, to actually start saying now uh, what your tax position is going to be in two years' time at such an uncertain uh, moment in the middle of an acute crisis is just tying your hands far, far too rigidly. Were he able to do it? Well, he could decide to do it in 2014. He's now... Uh, 2024. He, he's now committed himself for the next two years. He's got to make provision for a, a penny off the standard rate of income tax. Uh, whether it works uh, in making the government more popular would depend on what else is happening to the economy at the time. I'm very interested to get your thoughts on Ukraine and the sanctions that the international community has uh, imposed. There's been some criticism of countries such as Germany, for example, for not doing more on the energy they buy from Russia. Do you feel that the international con uh, community has gone far enough in the sanctions against Russia? I think if we can go further, we should. Uh, I mean, this is a, an acute, acute political crisis. This is an historic moment. It's changed, it's changed the post-Cold War politics very much for the worst. Uh, at the moment, the rules-based international order is collapsing. The globalised economy is, you know, that's coming to an end, that's collapsing. And the Russian attack in the Ukraine is the heart of this, uh, a, 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 an aggression into a neighbouring state state in order to enforce it in back into satellite uh, status. And if we decide that we can't directly intervene with military personnel and help, and we certainly should provide them with the military equipment they provide and they require, and sanctions, which at first were pathetic, we were taken by surprise by it. British, first British sanctions were on three men who were already been sanctioned by the Americans uh, and five little banks. Uh, then public opinion was quite rightly roused and public opinion drove governments, including the British government, into more serious sanctions affecting Russian banks, affecting the Russian economy. And we may well have to do more. Uh, and we, we do have to think, I'm, I hope now, given that we had no policy at all before this final invasion, despite the fact there'd been warfare inside Ukraine for the previous six years, uh, this is why our first reaction was so pathetic, I hope now we're planning very carefully for what we would do if we fail to stop Russia and Russia begins to take control uh, of Ukraine and deal harshly with it. Very quickly, because we are out of time, but 
I get to talk to you so rarely. I, I can't uh, forgive me for squeezing one yeah. more in. I've not been um, doing uh, interviews so much recently. I avoiding questions on Boris Gate. Well, this is just very quickly, and you can see it coming a mile off. Um, you said that the party gate row, the gatherings inside Downing Street in lockdown, fueled incredible cynicism, and that the prime minister is in one hell of a mess. Is he still in one hell of a mess, or do you think all is now forgotten? Uh, that's one of the rare occasions when a journalist got me to answer questions on the subject. Uh, I think Putin may well have rescued uh, Boris Johnson, actually. Partygate will come back when, eventually, the Met please stop messing about and we're allowed to have Sue Gray's report. But whether it will take off again, I'm not quite sure, but I continue to evade questions on Boris Gate. OK, very sensible. Uh, Ken Clark, thank you so much for your uh, time today. Thank you.